afternoon everyone, I'm <coughs> Joe Rafferty, I'm Chief Executive at Mercy Care. Rosie, thank you very much for those wise words. Welcome to your first AGM. Made me realise I'm starting my 13th AGM today. I make that point just to introduce really my first slide, which reflects a little bit on how much Mercy Care has changed over those 13 years. Uh, this time last year I stood here having just welcome former North West Boroughs Trust into the Mercy Care family and our Southport and Formby community nurses into this family. And I thought it was probably time just to pay a little attention to uh, how much the organisation uh, has changed and to reflect really that ambition we, we set out to have quite a few years ago, which was nobody really. Um, engages healthcare about one thing. You, know, you might go to your GP because you've got some sort of muscular pain or something, but actually the reality is we're this bag of chemicals that we call human beings, uh, you know, doesn't suffer from one affliction, we suffer from many afflictions at one point in time. Uh, and therefore we've, we've started to talk a little bit about our mission from head to toe and cradle to grave. I think that's quite a good way of reflect in the spread of services that we now have. You can see by looking here that we work in six places, principally across Merseyside, Liverpool, Sefton, St. Helens, Knowsley, Halton and Warrington. And in those communities, we serve a population of about, of about 1.4 million people. Um, whilst we have, as you can see there, almost 1,983 mental health beds, if you look at the bottom left hand, corner. You see, mainly speaking, we're in the community. We're in uh, outpatient clinics, we're in people's homes, we're in nursing homes. We're right out there in the community with people with a, an amazing over three million outpatient contacts uh, during the course of a year. And if you look at the top left hand side, you'll see there are not to 19 services delivered principally at Liverpool and Sefton. We have 100,000 children and young people uh, receiving universal receiving the universal healthy child program 100,000 children and young people that's an astonishing figure um, and you can see uh, you, you can see also here that um, we provide our services uh, over more than 230 sites now, it, it, it's unquestionably a very big operation that we now have in Mersey Care. But Rosie started off by saying this is a time of, I would say, almost unknown challenge for the NHS, certainly in my career. It's the toughest time I think any of us are going to face. Um, and I, I often like liken occasionally Mercy Care to a boat. And you can either be a very small boat in very rough seas, or you can be quite a big boat in rough seas. And I think sort of all the all the knowledge sort of implies the rougher the seas, the more stable a big boat is, and a small one. And I think that's sort of shown out through the pandemic as we were a big, resilient organisation. We were able to move staff, we were able to use our resources differently. We were able to support hundreds of charities and third sector organisations and other NHS organisations, for example, during the course of the pandemic. So I think it's been a good thing for us that we have um, uh, sort of done what we've done and steadily and safely grown our offer to the community. So at the end of this presentation, I'll go through our 23 to 28 strategy. It's very simple, but it'll tell you what we're, where we're thinking about going. Rosie touched on some of it. But I thought in the next two slides, I might uh, reflect on some of the highlights of 2022-23. Major issue for us during the course of uh, the last year was we were uh, visited by the Care Quality Commission, um, as is a sort of routine thing in healthcare. Uh, the trust was rated overall good from CQC, uh, and the trust continues to be recognised as outstanding for being well led. Uh, that's not anything to do, in a sense, with the senior leadership of the organisation. Well-led means that actually we're able to connect across the organisation. We have good systems and processes. 
uh, that we've got good information, that we understand our risks and we manage our risk really well. So that's the definition of wild led and I'm very proud that day uh, for the second time they found us outstanding and indeed this time around they found uh, the standard of our care to be outstanding as well. And if you think that even last year, we, even this year, we're still in recovery from the pandemic, um, that's a heck of a result to have got and I just personally want to thank every single member of staff in Mercy Care because because this is a reflection on them, it's not a reflection on the people sat at this top table. Um, we're just fortunate enough to be able to conduct this orchestra, but those are the people in the front line who make those sorts of things happen every day. It was great too to see 500 additional members of our staff reply to our annual staff survey, uh, with an increase in uh, how staff feel safe in Mercy Care. And that's a, a, a really important issue uh, to us. We, in the very, very difficult world of continuing to keep qualified staff uh, in our services and working on our wards and, and in our teams, we made a major investment in growing our own workforce, which is a really important strategic thing for us to do, uh, with 91 registered uh, nurse degree apprenticeships and 261 trainee nurse associate apprenticeships underway or already qualified. As Rosie said, then we secured a ten and a half million pounds investment uh, in mental health research for innovation in partnership with the University of Liverpool. Talk a little bit more about that at the back end of the conversation. But you'll have heard me say it before, and if you know mental health services as well or community health services as well, you'll know that we're always at the back end of the given out money uh, queue. Um, and when we talk about parity of esteem. You don't ever really feel it. And this is a major win for us to be able to attract resource like this, not just into to Mercy Care, but into Merseyside. Um, this money would otherwise have gone to Oxford or Cambridge or London. And it was really, really great for us to put together a combined effort with university colleagues to attract this resource into this part of the world. Um, Following success in Nosley, Liverpool, St Helens and Wirral, we extended our pilot Silver Birch service, that's about maternal uh, mental health, and that extended into Cheshire East, Cheshire West, Halton, Sefton and Warrington. So that, that gives us a pan-Cheshire and Merseyside approach to um, maternal mental health, which is hugely important. We also, during the course of 22-23, uh, built on and extended um, our big efforts around telemedicine and telehealth. We established the North West Only Heart Failure Virtual Ward in collaboration with other colleagues in uh, Merseyside. With early data showing a 50% reduction in both 30-day readmissions and 30-day mortality rates. So a really big shift in simply discharging people with heart failure back home. We discharge them back home through a virtual telehealth platform uh, that allows both those patients to um, continue to receive better uh, care, but also assist greatly their relatives in um, that whole self-management thing, which, which we know from other uh, pieces of work we've done, really improves the quality of life uh, for people discharged from hospital to home. We've made significant progress on our new mental health inpatient centre in Liverpool. Um, once open in 2024, that will be a replacement for Mosley Hill Hospital. Um, it'll signal the end of dormitory wards in Liverpool. So each patient in uh, nearly in all of our services will have a private room. Uh, with, the van, with the majority of those having access to uh, ensuite facilities. I remember standing here 13 years ago when uh, the quality of our inpatient wards was almost a consistent, and I was told it was the usual thing at the AGM, it was the usual thing probably for the first five AGMs I did. Uh, and now that we've uh, undergone an absolute transformation of an awful lot of our physical fabric and that's a, that's a fantastic thing uh, to be able to stand here and say. And lastly that point on mutual aid which I've al already made. 
So, in a way, we have negotiated an awful lot of change in the organisation through an awful lot of difficult times. And we've done that, not because we're um, super talented, although I have the privilege of working with a lot of super talented people, I have to say, um, but it was also because 10 years ago we set out a strategy that contained most of the things that we've now achieved. And you know, there's an old phrase, if you don't have a plan for where you're going, you're not likely to get there. It's a bit like going off on a long journey and not taking a map with you. I mean, you know, chances are you'll take a few wrong turns. And that strategy has served us very well in holding us together. So um, we've just refreshed that strategy, as Rosie said. So the next two slides are about uh, Mercy Care and what we hope Mercy Care will look like in 2028. In 2028, when I'll be an even older person, and not here, I'm sure, um, you'll be able to look at these and go, well, you know, it wasn't exactly right, but it was reasonably right. And that's all we ever use our strategy for. We don't write it down and think, magically, it'll be like that in five or ten years. It's a guide. It's a, it's a route map. But we're not afraid to take a different direction, or turn a different way, depending on uh, the sort of progress we see in front of us. So this is about being generally right. It's not about being precisely right. So um, you heard Rosie talk about total health, and that's sort of one of the major uh, platforms of what we're trying to achieve over the next five years. And to do that, we want to make Mercy Care known for its operational and clinical excellence. So, uh, I mean, it may seem strange to say patients will be our top priority, but there are NHS organisations where it doesn't feel like that. And we don't want this to be one of them. We don't always get it right, we know that, but we're open to learn. But, but what we also want to do is plan to consistently establish excellence in our services, evidence-based care wherever the evidence is available to, to guide us, and <clears throat> to have accessible care, very low weights, wherever it's possible. And that's at least one way for us to make sure that we're able to step, uh, take a step closer to that total care uh, aspect of what we do. Um, we want to, to um, think about uh, making sure that our staff are not just feel valued and supported, but are trained and capable of stepping into this new place. You know, it's um, very difficult to attract and retain staff in the NHS. You know that. You've watched the news like I have. Um, we've ongoing industrial action in the NHS. You know that like I know that. <clears throat> but one of the things we've got to do is make sure that our staff do feel valued, supported, trained, safe at work, all of those sorts of things. And that will be a key part of what we do culturally in the organisation. We know that organisations that focus on continuous improvement and have a culture that is focused on learning rather than just on holding people to account. Accountability should be about learning. Organisations that do that achieve a lot. And then, if you think about doing those two things in concert, one and two, we get to this notion of supporting people with their total health. You know, we run a range of services that range from physical health, mental health, learning disability, addictions, quite a lot of, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of detail under those big umbrella definitions. And we want to remove the need for them to be thought about separately. So we know, for example, that people with the breathing disorder, COPD, somewhere between 35 and 40% of those people have got moderate to severe depression. So we can do a wonderful job giving people new and different types of drugs to stabilise or improve their COPD. But they're still going to lead miserable lives. So we've got to stop thinking of what we might call the ologies, seeing people in, in strips and sorts of disease types, and actually build a pattern of service around people where we consider their medical needs, of course, but their psychological needs, and really, really importantly, their social needs, because those three things intersect profoundly to make better outcomes for people. 
Then, in terms of last uh, consideration here, we'll increase value, achieving the best outcomes from the resources available. The NHS is under financial pressure. Um, people are living a longer time. There's more costly ways to intervene in people's lives. Um, and people, uh, as they live longer, develop what we call multiple comorbidities. So we don't really see anybody now who's just got diabetes. People with diabetes have four or five other uh, comorbidities associated with them. So, so we've got to think about uh, making sure our resources stretch further. That's not just about making our money and the trust work better, but it's about making NHS money across our communities work better. A tremendous example of that is the work that, for example, we're currently doing with Liverpool University Hospital Trust to make sure that we connect as carefully as possible around people before they go into hospital and after they come out of hospital. So making sure, in a sense, that we utilise those NHS points in a collective way, not just in a way where we're going to duplicate and waste money and do all of those sorts of things. And any of you who were at a board meeting this morning would have heard about the uh, baby and bonding uh, attachment service that we have in Sefton and many other places where you would see how Mercy Care and Sefton Council in that instance are working really closely together to put some very precious points, very limited points, but to put them together to create new relationships, often with people who have traumatic childhoods themselves as they enter parenthood. And that has had a magnificent effect on people, reducing the number of children who go into care and so on. So that's, those are real practical ways that we're starting to sweat our assets, our services, our relationships with each other to drive something better. And we use data and technology in a different way. Um, we don't want to use this in a way that excludes a patient and public populations. So we've got to be really careful about what some people do describe as the digital gap, the people who aren't comfortable with digital technology. So we want to make that a big conversation with uh, the population and people who use our services. But we do know that technology can do fantastic things. I've talked about the virtual board already. So our ability for people with physical healthcare conditions to monitor themselves or to have their family support work with them to build that sense of uh, self-management and care, which we know reduces by about a quarter the number of people who, for example, have diabetes who end up having a hospital admission in a year. And that's the start of what we've done. It's not the finish of what we've done. It's not even reached into the full potential of what we can do with technology. So that will remain a, an important aspect for us, as will data. And when we talk about data in healthcare, people understandably get nervous. But we've done something in uh, Merseyside called the Civic Data Cooperative, led out of the, the University of Manchester. And Merseycare has been a big part of that where we've created a civic umbrella to keep people's data protected. So when we talk about your data, we, we, we want to use your data to connect your data so that we can understand what goes on in your physical care as well as your mental health care, as well as how you engage socially. But what we're not going to do is sell your data to the pharmaceutical industry or anybody else who wants to have it. Your data is yours and we only use it with your permission to allow us to use it. Which links into the last point I want to make. Um, we will lead world-class research and innovation in mental health and wellbeing. So it refers to the 10.5 million that um, I'm still very pleased we, we took from the south and brought to the north. Um, this is one of the most needy populations in Western Europe, actually, when you look at the incidence of mental health, prevalence and incidence in, uh, in, in, in Merseyside. <clears throat> And it's, it's morally wrong that people in this part of the country don't get access to mental health clinical trials. And indeed, mental health clinical trials are a pretty rare thing, generally speaking, across the NHS. Well, we're going to try and change that. So the Mental Health Research for Innovation Centre is will grow, it'll grow over the next couple of years, to explicitly offer anybody who wants to have a clinical trial, that might be a new drug, it might be a new digital device. It might actually be a social intervention, or it might be a combination of any of those things. But we will make available 
for anyone who wants it, access to the clinical trial. And I think only on 6th of October, we're opening the Transmagnetic Stimulation Service uh, at Wisdom. Um, and uh, that service will be the first where we start to extend our trialing capability, where it will move into a fully facilitated mood disorder service, looking at difficult to treat depression in the first instance. Um, and we will begin slowly to open up people in who qualify in that category for access to clinical trials. I think that is going to be something that will revolutionise how it will feel. Is it just for mental health? Well, at the minute this is just for mental health, but like everything, once you plant one seed, something else grows. So immediately, for those members of staff or people who relate to the physical health side of Mercy Care, we're already begin, beginning to build a platform of research in antimicrobial drug resistance, which is that thing about when you take antibiotics, you've got to be really careful to get the right antibiotics and not for too long, otherwise you develop antibiotic resistance. So we're going to be a critical part alongside University Hospital Liverpool in building a new programme to combat uh, antibiotic resistance. So you see we've done one thing and sort of within six months we're able to grow into another thing. And that's the ability, just returning to the start where I was, of being big enough to be flexible enough to get into these sorts of really influential things to do. So I hope you found that helpful and interesting. So that's a bit of a tour through last year and what it might look like in 2028.